on here at this time, and, it, and if you guys join us uh, as we get going, then that's fine. Uh, my name is Ed Damask. I'm here with uh, Dennis Judy, and we're doing um, obviously this this webinar on minimum risk mosquito control um, methods and, and um, information regarding training. Um, Pushing that aside, talking about the CEU credit, uh, there is a form that will be emailed to everybody. Uh, if you're in Georgia and Tennessee, the same form you can fill out and submit it for your CEU credits. Uh, in the other states where we are approved um, immediately, which is New Mexico and Colorado, uh, I will submit your information that you are on here as through the attendee list when you registered and that will get you credit um, so we've already gone through with the with those states uh, to make sure that that you will get your credits by doing it those ways um, also just want to uh, let you know that we do have two additional webinars coming up this is the first in a, in a regular series Next one is on perimeter pest control in May, uh, May 19th, and then we have one on resistance on June 9th. Um, from from here on, they're they're basically every three weeks on a Tuesday, so that's an easy way, and they're at the exact same time. Um, and then uh, definitely want to say um, thank you to EcoRader for sponsoring the series of webinars. EcoRater is a uh, leading botanical um, bio insecticide uh, that's used by PMPs throughout the country. Uh, their products are, are known for delivering fast, effective control of products like, uh, or, or insects like mosquitoes, bugs, uh, bed bugs, ants, roaches, other insects. Uh, they have a, a great RTU uh, and, and um, they have a wonderful mosquito product that they launched a little over a year ago that has has uh, helped PMPs throughout the country. So uh, on the tail end of this, you can always consider signing up for their free test run. Um, they um, basically are our sponsor underwriting this whole series to make sure that we're getting credits through webinars. Um, other than that, I'll hand it over to Dennis Judy. Dennis, if you haven't haven't read his bio, he is a former chairman of the Georgia Pest Control Association. He serves as a technical advisor and has spent 18 years uh, in technical support and management for Orkin and All Good Pest Solutions. So Dennis, you can take it away from here. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, just as a point of clarification on the CEUs for Tennessee and for Georgia, uh, you need to return that form back to EcoRader. Uh, they will collect them and send them on to me, and then I will submit them to the state. Sorry about that, my mistake there. Yeah, just wanted to make sure they were clear on where to send them. So uh, <clears throat> that's where they go. All right, well, we're going to talk today about uh, mosquito reduction uh, and uh, we'll get right into it. So uh, one, one of the greatest defenses that we have against mosquito-borne diseases uh, and illnesses that they can transmit is really you. You're the healthcare professional when it comes to uh, a lot of this service for mosquito reduction to help prevent mosquito-borne illnesses. So be the professional that you can be and uh, take pride in what you're doing as a health control professional. Uh, you can reduce your client's exposure to bites. Uh, you're not gonna stop anything as far as the, uh, the illness or any of the uh, uh, things that they transmit, but they can't transmit if they're not there to bite people. So that is where you come in uh, is uh, doing a, a very good inspection, looking for their breeding sites, looking for places where they can harbor and rest and find habitat. Uh, 
uh, you treat to control the mosquitoes, uh, reduce their numbers uh, where people are active. You can suggest a lot of corrective actions to your customers uh, and encourage them and enlist their support in correcting uh, situations that would be conducive to mosquitoes harboring, uh, breeding especially. And you certainly can do a, a large part in educating the consumer out there. So we're going to hone in on a lot of these factors uh, in this next hour and, and uh, hopefully give you some clues. A lot of you probably know a lot uh, about mosquitoes. That's why you're on here today anyway. But uh, we might be able to offer you something extra that you can use in your toolbox to enlighten your customers and make your service even better. So it all starts with uh, the life cycle of the mosquito. Of course, they, uh, they start with an egg. Uh, they have a complete metamorphosis. From that leg, uh, leg from that egg, larvae hatch out. Uh, these larvae uh, grow in the water. They need water to develop. Uh, that egg may be deposited in the water, on the water surface, or it may be just deposited along an area that is prone to getting wet. Uh, and then they'll hatch out when that water is there. But then these larvae will come out and we call those the wigglers. Uh, they go through several instars, you'll hear this again. And uh, from there they go to the pupa stage. There you see a close up of the pupa stage. One of the things you got to realize about that pupa stage is they have what is called a trumpet. Um, they have a siphon as well, and that siphon tube goes up to the surface of the water. So you'll always find these floating or long on the surface of the water, and they'll have that breathing tube sticking up there. They, uh, they have to get air to breathe. They're not like that wiggler that can go through the water all the time. Uh, so the pupae stage is prone to drowning, and that uh, is a significant factor when it uh, comes into some of the things that we can do to alter the environment, uh, make changes, and we'll talk about that as well. The pupae then emerges uh, as an adult mosquito that has the uh, ability then to transmit uh, diseases. It, it bites things, uh, it, it picks up the blood from the things that it bites, and then it can transfer that blood to a human when it bites a human. Uh, and that causes the problem. And of course, then the adult mosquito can go back and start the life cycle again by laying hundreds to thousands of eggs. And uh, there we go with that vicious cycle recurring. So when they lay their eggs, they can either lay them singly or uh, some species will lay them in what is called a raft. They'll put hundreds of them together and they'll float like a little boat on top of the water. And uh, these little rafts, I mean, they're extremely small. Uh, a grain of rice is uh, about what one of these rafts may look like floating on the water. Uh, from that again, they go through the larva stage. The larva develop through four different instars. That larvae feeds on bacteria and organic debris in the water. So they spend their entire uh, cycle in the water. Uh, they pupate, and there's a better picture of it. You can see the little siphon tube sticking up to the surface of the water that they breathe through. And then um, they're ready to come out as an adult. They'll split out of the pupa case, uh, come up onto the surface of the water uh, above the pupa case, uh, and get dried off and fly away. So your job, your main job, uh, really isn't treating as much as it is inspecting. You've got to do a complete and thorough survey. And what you're going to inspect for are things that can be a potential breeding site. You need to locate their resting sites. Where do they like to live? Uh, where do they like to harbor? What are the areas where they're going to spend their time when, uh, when the adult is out there uh, not flying around? Uh, and those are the areas that you need to target then uh, as part of your treatment. But you also have to ask yourself a lot of questions, or you can even ask your customer some of these questions too. What are the known structural problems? Look for them. Uh, your customers may not be aware of some of these issues that they have. 
do they have structural problems that could lend themselves to breeding or harboring of the mosquito? Uh, look for water containers, anything at all that could contain water, even if it's as small as a little bottle cap. Uh, it's plentiful for uh, breeding of mosquitoes. And then again, look for those areas within the surroundings, the environment of the customer's uh, property that uh, could be conducive to them breeding, uh, or again, could be a shaded resting area. We've provided this form. It's something I developed in a previous life and uh, have used it significantly. Uh, it is on that website. You might want to write down that website uh, unless you've already been to it and know how to get there. Uh, www.ecoraderpmp.com. Uh, and this inspection report form is there for your use. It's going to help you conduct a very thorough survey. It may not be uh, all engulfing, but it has certainly a, a very large list of potential breeding sites there that can help you uh, serve as a checklist when you're going through your inspection. And then uh, it can help you formulate your control strategy and control methods as you go about doing the job for your customer. And then also it can become a good communication report back to your customer. Uh, it may be that they need to fix something and you can put this in writing to them. Uh, plenty of room on there to make your comments. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of these things as we go through this today. Uh, I'm not going to uh, irritate you by trying to read that whole list to you right now, but there's a pretty good list of things there where uh, mosquitoes can breed. And most of these things that you notice there is uh, something that really is going to contain water or has the ability to contain water. So feel free to take this report from ecoraderpmp.com and uh, make it your own. Uh, you, you have my blessing to take it, recreate it, and use it for yourself. As you're using the report, you need to look for the structural elements that have that potential to provide the breeding sites or the resting sites for the mosquitoes. Uh, sometimes it may not be an area that's specifically wet. It may just be something that's shaded in the, uh, in the middle of the day when it's very hot. The mosquitoes like to go and uh, stay in a shaded area. Uh, if they're a uh, night flying mosquito, especially, and uh, you can find these spots and certainly treat these spots as well. Uh, the bigger issue is containers that have the potential to hold water. So check off those things, anything that's on there that's, that's applicable to what you're finding. Uh, and note those areas that have the uh, standing water or the potential to hold water uh, or to be a shaded resting site for them. And use it to your ability as a roadmap and to provide your treatment uh, or make your suggestions for types of repairs that may be necessary. So it all comes back to reducing the source. Uh, you wanna reduce the source of the mosquito activity. Mosquitoes are gonna take seven days to go through their life history. So egg larvae, pupae to adult, uh, laying more eggs, it's gonna take seven days for them to develop. And those first three stages that we talked about, the egg stage, the larva stage, the pupa stage, they all are in the water. So that should give you a hint. The best way that you can stop mosquitoes from breeding is to either remove or to treat that stagnant water source. Stagnant being a key word as well. Remember we told you that the pupae uh, has to have that breeding tube going up to get the air. So if you've got water that is moving, it's not as critical. You're not going to be able to get uh, the mosquito to go through its entire life cycle in moving water because the pupae would probably just drown from not being able to get the air to breathe and die off in moving water. So it might be that you've got some facility somewhere, maybe a bird bath, a water fountain, and uh, you could put a pump in there just to keep the water agitated. 
they would still have the fountain working, but uh, there would be no um, good way for the mosquito to breed in there because of that movement of the water. But stagnant water is your big enemy. So you need to think about source reduction when you're talking mosquito reduction. Uh, you need to physically take away items if they have that potential that they could hold stagnant water. And a lot of times we overlook things. Uh, like I said earlier, you might find a bottle cap. Uh, I found uh, hundreds of larvae breeding in an upside down container off of an aerosol spray can. I think it was a paint can top that had filled with water in the rain and then the mosquitoes found it and that's where they laid their eggs. Uh, so you want to find any of these things that have that potential that they could hold water. Empty that water from any items that you can, or cover those items with lids if they have them, uh, or just turn it upside down and let it drain out so that it won't hold the water anymore. Uh, one of your biggest culprits out there is probably a trash can that, that does not have a lid over it. And even though it may have some trash in it, if it's standing upright, it collects water in the bottom or the lid is laying on the ground next to it and it's containing water. Uh, and that's plenty for it to uh, create a source for them to breed in. So make sure you're looking for all these things. Uh, any item that has that potential to hold water needs to be addressed. Instruct your homeowners to change the water in any small containers that they have weekly. Uh, educate them on the seven day life cycle. Let them know if they're dumping that water at least once a week, they're gonna be a big help in stopping the breeding cycle. If they have those little small wading pools or if they've got toys that uh, uh, like buckets or play tables or things like that that contain water, they need to be emptied and stored after each use and that'll prevent the water from collecting or becoming stagnant in there. So they play a big part in helping you take care of their problem. Mechanical alteration of items is another way to help. Uh, so, you know, you need a good drill. Get you a drill with a drill bit. And I guarantee you, if you take that drill and you put a hole in the bottom of that boat hole, hull, it's not going to contain water. Uh, therefore, it's not going to breed mosquitoes. But you probably wouldn't have a happy customer then, would you? So uh, you need to check those things. And that's really why I put the, uh, the plug up there. You can buy these plugs. They can be installed or direct your customers to put drain plugs in things that need them. Most boats come with a drain plug, so make sure they're draining them. Uh, sometimes they forget to pull the drain plugs. Make sure that tarp on top is uh, taut so that it's not collecting water, so that the water, when it does hit it, runs off. Uh, and, and talk to your customers about these things. Uh, the old tire swing out there, a lot of fun. My little grandsons love those things. We've got a couple of them hanging in the trees at their house. But one of the best things you can do with, with uh, toys like that is take that drill and, and put some drain holes in the bottom of it. Let the water go down in there and, and drain out the bottom. Uh, something that simple can make a big difference in the way mosquitoes uh, breed or harbor on your customer's property. So think about things that you could mechanically alter. Uh, my kids, when they were growing up, had one of those little plastic, little type picnic tables, and it was always filling up with water down in the legs. So it might be as simple as just drilling a hole in the bottom of the leg to let the water run out of something like that. Uh, uh, so make sure that you're checking for anything that you can alter to stop it from holding water if it's not intended to hold water. You've also got cultural controls. Uh, you're not mechanically altering something here, but you're physically making a change to the environment. Uh, so think about culture, mowing the lawn, trimming weeds. That's a cultural control. Uh, if you've got really, really thick weeds out there, those become harborage sites. They become uh, areas that a mosquito may want to just live in uh, when it's not out buzzing around. And just by simply trimming those down makes a big difference. 
uh, or eliminate potential resting sites. Uh, they may have a swampy area where something dumps out and it's good that that water is being dumped out away from the house, but it still creates a situation where water is collecting. Uh, mosquitoes find that dampness, they'll go there, they'll lay the eggs even if it's not uh, currently holding water, but then when it does fill up with water and that puddle is there for uh, you know the seven day cycle, then you've got breeding going on. So uh, again, provide instructions to them that they need to uh, make some cultural controls there and, and eliminate that, make sure it's good runoff so that it's not collecting water out there and becoming stagnant. Uh, they make extenders for gutters. Uh, sometimes you have to suggest that they use those uh, to get things moving away from puddling. Uh, there's a fountain, bird bath fountain, and uh, just what we talked about, if you put a pump in there so that it's constantly uh, having the water moving, then the mosquitoes aren't going to be able to go through the complete life cycle there because the water will not be stagnant. Uh, and then think about screening of things. Sometimes you can simply uh, provide screening to keep them out of areas. So lots of different things you can do both mechanically and culturally to help reduce the mosquito population in a given area. Once you've done those kind of things, then it's time for our expertise of another nature to set in, and that's the use of larvicides. Uh, which will prevent the adult mosquitoes from emerging. So if you can kill the larvae stage of it, uh, it's never going to make it to the adult stage, stop the life cycle. You can also use adulticides. The adulticides are used to knock down the adult populations and to establish barriers. Uh, and again, that's uh, really what bothers the homeowner is that adult that's coming in and biting them. So you want to use the adulticide to knock down uh, any of those uh, populations that are there and then you can create barriers where they rest so that it will kill them before they can establish large numbers and, and become a, a big problem. So larvicides, uh, you can apply larvicides directly into the water site during the development of the, uh, the immature mosquito. And that is going to result in that larvae being controlled before it can become the adult uh, and free to fly off from that stagnant water. Uh, one of the things that, that Eco Raider prides itself on is the ER3 insect killer that they've created is a larvicide. So you have a choice. You can either use larvicides from uh, uh, other sources that you purchase and you can put out there into the uh, stagnant water or you can simply take the ER3 that you're using as an adulticide for your barriers and spray it directly into the water as well. Uh, it is labeled for use in water and uh, it, it can help you as you uh, go through those physical and cultural methods to also become the larvicide treatment that you're using. Uh, very safe when it comes to uh, putting it in water. Uh, ER3 works on something in the insect called octopamine, which is an enzyme. Uh, so it's not working like your normal pesticides that you use. And octopamine is only found in living things that do not have a backbone. So since it works on octopamine, it's not going to be have any harmful effects on anything that has a vertebrate. So uh, you know, people or pets or fish or birds or anything at all like that, uh, living creatures that have a backbone are not going to be affected by the use of ER3 as a larvicide. So some of the areas that are, are good potential treatment areas uh, for your larvicides, you've got bird baths, naturally, that's what we think of. Uh, and everybody's worried, you know, we always tell people you need to dump that bird bath out, you know, at least on a weekly basis. And, and I'm sure our customers uh, with good intentions try to do that, but uh, a lot of them forget. A lot of them don't have time. It slips their mind uh, and it doesn't get emptied and filled back up. 
well, you could treat that bird bath now and not have to worry about the birds. Uh, they have urns that may collect water. Uh, the big old trees out in the yard that have the holes where the branches uh, form out together and you got a tree hole going down in there. Those collect water, so you could, uh, you could put a larvicide down in there. We talked about the old tires. Uh, a lot of people now are collecting rain, rainwater in, in barrels to use for irrigation purposes. Uh, and they're a little concerned, but with the use of the larvicide in there, it should not be detrimental to anything that they intend to water with that collected water. Uh, a lot of people create water gardens now. They, they, uh, they're using uh, water fixtures to decorate their, their yards and plant uh, aquatic plants in. And of course, that is also conducive to the rearing of mosquitoes. So again, you want to think about larvicides in those areas. We often overlook flower pots. Uh, a lot of times flower pots don't drain well or the pot itself may drain well, but it has that collector pan under it that is there just specifically for the purpose of collecting water. So some larvicides in those pots, uh, in those pans under the pots, would, would be wonderful. Roof gutters. Uh, roof gutters are supposed to be sloped so that they run off and uh, drain the water away from the structure. Sometimes they, uh, they have weaknesses due to the fact that they get old and they sag. And when that happens, uh, they create puddles within the gutters. And of course, a mosquito probably could find that and that could become a prime area for them to start laying eggs. Uh, pool covers. People cover the pools just like the boat we saw and then they get the sag in the middle of the pool cover and it's constantly having that little puddle, puddle of water on it. So if it's warm enough for the mosquitoes to be out, uh, it's probably warm enough for those pool covers to disappear as well. And that would help take care of that problem. Or you could simply treat it with a larvicide to stop any uh, breeding from going on in the puddling stagnant water on that pool cover. You've got the ornamental fountains that we talked about. Uh, one of the biggies is an old abandoned swimming pool somewhere. I have a friend that lives uh, not too far from me, and uh, he certainly takes care of his own backyard, but he had a neighbor lady that let her swimming pool go abandoned. Um, she didn't cover it. She didn't drain it. It's been standing there for years with uh, stagnant water in it. And about the only thing he could really do there was either try to get permission to go over there and treat it, uh, to help her out, which I think she did let him do that at one point. Uh, or you may have to get the health uh, departments involved at coming in and uh, uh, doing it as a public nuisance of some type, depending on your situation. And then search for any other things that could hold water uh, again, as we said. Uh, three stages of the life cycle all are aquatic. So water is our big nemesis. If you can control the water, uh, if you can treat any water that you can't control and drain away with the larvicide, you'll go a long ways in uh, reducing your mosquito populations. Then we use adulticides. The adulticides uh, can be used for space treatments. Those mosquitoes fly freely to uh, just about any non-protected place where they want to go. So we can apply space treatments for a quick knockdown. Uh, I used to live in West Virginia. I used to live in New York. And in both of the towns we lived in, they had uh, uh, the health department, county departments came around with the truck mounted sprayers and fogged the air. And uh, everything was great for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, of course, you didn't want to be out there when they were fogging. so. Uh, it, it gave you a quick knockdown, uh, and the timing was very critical to that success. You know, do you have night flying insects or day flying insects? They usually came uh, in the evenings and had a route, and one day a week they would bring the truck around, and, and uh, it worked okay for that one evening. You couldn't stand to be out there because of the product they were spraying on that evening, but by the next evening, uh, everything was back the way it was because all they were really doing was knocking the flyers out of the air. Uh, 
the ones that were in harborage somewhere or the ones that were breeding somewhere came right back in the minute they were done doing that. So your space treatments probably would be really good for uh, you're planning a festival or a picnic or some backyard big party or something and you want to knock things down quick then uh, doing that space treatment really really helps to get rid of the adults that are flying around there but they don't last long term as far as a space treatment. So the critical part of it then becomes barrier treatments. You want to really target your adult facades as barrier treatments. Barrier controls are much more effective in the long run. Uh, they last longer. Uh, you're going to target areas that are shaded. You're going to target the back sides of the leaves and the shrubs and up under harborage areas uh, that are going to stay dry probably, uh, shaded from the sun but you want to leave a residual uh, protective barrier there so that as the mosquitoes are trying to find a place to rest they're going to be resting right on a treated surface and your barrier is going to help eliminate them so it may involve this water-based application of er3 or whatever your favorite product is that you're using but the whole idea is to create barriers in these resting sites uh, with ER3, the natural ingredients are applied as a light mist with that high volume air blast from uh, some type of a mister blower. And I'm sure that's what a lot of folks are doing with whatever product they choose. Uh, and you can apply this then to grass and shrubbery and foliage and any shaded areas where these things come about. And the whole idea is to get a protective barrier there so that when the mosquito goes there to rest, it's going to come in contact with that treated barrier. And again, when you're doing the shrubbery, I always tell my guys, uh, you know, when you're out there blowing that, that uh, shrub, I don't want you coating the top of the leaf. I want you to coat the bottom of the leaf. Uh, get up under it. That's where the mosquito is going to go to rest to get out of the sunlight uh, in that shaded area. And it, it does twofold for you as well when your customer says, hey, it's rained a lot. Uh, it probably washed away everything you put out. You can explain to them, hey, we actually treated the undersides of the leaves and uh, uh, the product should still be good there because the rain hits the tops of the leaves and runs right off. So again, with the products you're using as liquids, you can easily apply them through some type of a handheld sprayer. Uh, you can use a backpack sprayer, uh, you could use the power spray units, but we really have found in mosquito reduction that your best tool is some type of a misting blowing uh, piece of equipment. Uh, the one you see there is my personal one, it's the Steel uh, 450 Mister Blower, but there's a lot of good ones on the market. So choose the one that's best. Uh, the reason I suggest using the misting blowing equipment again is what we just talked about. It will force the product up under things. And if you're just spraying with a backpack, it's hard to get the bottom surfaces of those things coated. You're probably just going to be hitting the upper surfaces and, and uh, then getting that wash off as things rain on it. So invest in good equipment and then use it properly. Okay, a, a large part of your service as well, once you've done the larviciding and the adulticiding, is the proper use then of communication tools. You can use this mosquito reduction inspection report as part of your communication. I'm sure that your states probably have uh, instructions for you on uh, service tickets, uh, leaving a ticket behind that 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 reports the products that you're using and where you put them and things of that nature. But this goes into addition to that. Uh, it helps you communicate well with the customer as to things that you've done extra uh, or things that they can do that would really help your situation. And you also have to be thinking about other communication tools that, that you can use to help educate your customer. Your associations out there have things available. Uh, you may have created some literature yourself. 
uh, to help educate your customer. Uh, you can send them emails, uh, blog blast, whatever it is that uh, works for you. But the more you can communicate to them about the things that they need to do, uh, the more your partnership in this mosquito reduction is going to be favorable for everybody involved. So again, use this report, uh, you know, check off the things that you're finding, uh, describe it if you can as best as well. Where is it? Bird bath in the yard and back, uh, buckets and pails under the deck in the back. Uh, what is your control strategy for those? Did you use source reduction? Uh, you know, did you just empty the buckets and pails or did you actually treat them with the larvicide? So you can check off whether you used reduction tactics or if you did a treatment. And then your control methods, if you're actually doing that, um, did you apply larvicide? Did you apply adulticide? Or did you use some type of a mechanical or cultural control method? And then you can comment on that or anything that they may need to do in addition to it. This becomes a very, very valuable report if you use it, teach all your people to use it well. So a few things about Eco Raider. It is a triple action. Uh, that's why we called it ER3, but it is an adulticide. It can also be used as a larvicide. Uh, and of course, you can also use it as a spatial repellent if you want to use space spray techniques for those special events. So it'll serve all three purposes uh, and do it quite well. It, uh, it has a high efficacy and uh, low cost in comparison with other green products out there. Uh, the triple action formula kills the adults on contact. It leaves the, the residual uh, behind as a barrier. Uh, it also kills mosquito in the water uh, without harm to anything else that's in the water. And you can use it for that spatial repellency. So all of that comes in one application. You don't have to stop and, and go grab something else to do a second part of the job. It, it can all be done at one time. Uh, very flexible use. Use it in a lot of different environments. Uh, it's a low impact green formula. It is 25B exempt, so it doesn't have that EPA registration number. Uh, it is exempt from registration as a, a green low impact formula. Uh, safety is, is critical when it comes to mosquito reduction programs. Uh, very safe to use around children and around pets, and it's safe, as we said, for the plants and the fish and any wild animals that might be out there. Uh, it has an odor, but it's more of a flowery odor. As a matter of fact, when we were doing the field trials with this, uh, we got some non-solicited feedback from customers that told us how well they really liked the smell of their yards when the technicians were finished doing it. So uh, very low impact, non-staining, um, and there's no need really to, re to require any kind of a spray notification to people unless you're in a state that just very specifically requires that. Uh, good in sensitive environments or really any environment. So backyards, we're all used to treating, uh, uh, treating for an outdoor party. Uh, people have barbecues, uh, can be used around schoolyards without being uh, uh, overly burdensome. If you do school accounts and they have mosquito problems or daycare centers and they have mosquito problems, the only thing I'd advise you to be careful with there is sometimes those folks have butterfly gardens as school projects. You might want to not target those areas, uh, mark them as not being treated so that you're not uh, doing anything to their school research in their butterfly gardens. But other than that, it's uh, very, very effective, very, very safe in all these different areas. Uh, fact is, uh, I had a son that got married a couple years ago. I sent my guys out the day before. He got married on a back deck, a huge, large back deck of a friend's house because he wanted an outdoor wedding and the place was just eat up with mosquitoes. And I sent our guys out to do a treatment the day before. And, um, the friend was so impressed with uh, the length of time that he went without mosquitoes after that, that he wanted to sign up right away for the program. So it worked very, very well. 
And of course, retention ponds are a big problem everywhere. You can even use it around the, the retention ponds without worrying about the wildlife that lives in them. Fast effective, lasting green, uh, let you look at some of those things, but uh, direct spray mortality, uh, knocked them down very quickly and uh, lasted uh, uh, quite a while. The, uh, all the mosquitoes in the trial were dead within the 24 hour period. Uh, and it killed all the mosquitoes that it came in contact with, so uh, very quickly. Uh, larvicidal action, you can see that the, uh, the product itself uh, was treated uh, or was put in water and aged for one or two weeks. In other words, the water was treated and left standing before the mosquitoes were added to it, the larvae. Uh, when the larvae were put into the one week aged uh, treated water, 100% uh, of the larvae were killed within the first day. Uh, we introduced larvae into the two-week setting and it killed 93% of them within uh, that first day. <coughs> so very, very quick action when it comes to the larvicidal action as well. Spatial repellency, again, one hour age dry residuals. Uh, it acted, uh, we, we actually tried it against Cutter, which everybody recognizes as a brand name that the homeowner can buy and uh, used it as repellency and uh, it acted much quicker uh, and lasted a little longer than the Cutter did. So it kept mosquitoes away from the treated area for, uh, you know, the time frame that it was needed. Like I said, the wedding or the special event. Uh, and then, uh, Spatial activity over time, well, naturally, anytime you're treating the air, stuff's going to fall out of the air, but that repellency factor uh, worked for quite a while, up to 96 hours, uh, uh, as part of that protection when it was just used as a spatial repellent. So again, uh, you need to use these things, whether you're using Eco Raider or, or whatever you choose to use, you need to have a good adulticide. Uh, you need to have something that will give you some repellency from an area once that space has been treated and you need something that you can use as a larvicide. And uh, the key thing here with Eco Raider is it does all three things with that one product. So uh, it's a choice you can make to add it to your toolbox or uh, whatever you do, whatever products you choose to use, make sure you're using them in the right ways. Uh, and using all three types of uh, treatments to your most effect. We have a video I'm going to show you to uh, kind of wrap up the program today. It's a video that we created. Uh, it'll kind of back up all the things we've talked about. And if you go to that same website, ecoraderpmp.com, uh, this video is posted there and you'll be able to use it. You can share it with your technicians, uh, other folks that you work with, uh, and use it in whatever way you see fit. So we hope you enjoy it. Hi, I'm Dennis Judy. I'm the technical director for EcoRader. And today we're going to introduce you to our unique new formulation, our next generation called ER3. ER3 is a green formula that exhibits triple action effect. That's why we named it ER3. Not only does it serve a, a purpose against mosquitoes as an adulticide, but it also replaces other products in your arsenal because it can be used as a larvicide as well. And the unique formulation that we have here also gives us a spatial repellency. So mosquitoes can be repelled from areas where they are, they are not wanted. This new green formulation is going to help you immensely as you go into your mosquito reduction programs. One of the first things that we do is a thorough inspection. We will walk the property and do a thorough survey of the site to determine any potential for mosquitoes to breed or to locate their resting sites. When we do this, we have to ask ourselves three questions. Number one, are there any structural problems that are conducive to water retention? 
The second question we have to ask is what items might be present that have the ability to retain water? And third, we have to ask, does the environment itself provide potential breeding sites? As we get involved in the inspection, we will use the Mosquito Reduction Inspection Report as our basic guideline. The report is a checklist of potential breeding sites that may be found as you walk the property. Check off those sites identified during your inspection and note their location on the report. While you're doing this report, Look for structural elements such as flat roofs, blocked or poorly drained rain gutters, downspouts, the drain lines on air conditioning units, low decks and open crawl spaces, unscreened vents that lead into the, the structure. Also check for detached storage sheds that have the potential to provide a breeding or resting site for the mosquitoes. While doing your inspection, make note of any container that is holding or has a potential to hold water. Remember, this could be something as small as a bottle cap, or it could be as large as a boat or a swimming pool. Look for tree holes, search for heavy weeds or shrubs, any plants, any small ponds or wooded areas that provide potential for standing water and also look for all the shaded resting sites. The next phase of our program is source reduction. Mosquitoes take about seven days to thoroughly go through their life cycle. The first three stages in their cycle are the aquatic stages. The eggs, the larvae, the pupae all develop in water until they emerge as adults. Therefore, the best way to prevent mosquito breeding is to remove stagnant water, and this can be accomplished in a number of ways. One method is to physically remove the item that has potential to hold stagnant water. Things such as garden implements that have the ability to retain water, garbage cans, small pails, so empty the water from these, cover them with lids, or turn them upside down so that they drain. Another method that we can use to control mosquitoes is cultural controls. Cultural methods can be utilized to reduce the potential sources of mosquito breeding. They can also be used to eliminate potential resting sites that can attract adult mosquitoes. Proper mowing and trimming reduce the resource areas required by mosquitoes for their resting sites. Rain gutters can be cleaned and repaired so that all water flows freely into and out of the downspouts without collecting in the gutters. Standing water in small ponds or in pools can be helped by using pumps and filters to prevent stagnation. If the water is moving, then the pupae stage of the mosquito cannot live in it. A proper treatment regimen is important for the control of mosquitoes after you've done your source reduction efforts and your cultural control practices. All right, before we get started with our treatment, I wanted to give you a few tips on the mixing of the product. The ER3 comes in this convenient tip and measure uh, gallon size container. So the first thing I'm going to instruct you to do is shake it up real good. There are four different active ingredients in this product. We want to make sure they're all blended well before you put them into your sprayer. Now you have an option here as well. Uh, you really need to agitate things good in the sprayer before you start treating. This is a big old heavy sprayer. I don't like picking it up and shaking it. So what I like to tell people to do is measure with your tip and pour. You can get the right amount of product into the reservoir, the four ounce mark, take that product and put it in a separate container. We'll go through that process again because I want to use eight ounces of product for this application. Get it measured into your tip and pour in the right quantity. Now that we've got it into this other container that has water in it already, I can agitate this mixture before I put it into the spray tank. So just take that, agitate it really well. And now you can take this mixture that you have, pour it into your sprayer, and you'll be ready to go. 
this new product contains a blend of natural ingredients that are applied as a light mist with a sprayer preferably a high volume air blast that pushes the product into the foliage and into other difficult to reach spots. This light mist can be applied to grass, shrubbery, foliage, under shaded areas such as storage sheds and decks, and around animal shelters, dog houses, and etc. Eco Raiders formula ER3 works well as a larvicide and can be applied to potential breeding sites that you are unable to control through physical or cultural methods. Potential treatment areas for ER3 include things like bird baths, urns, water gardens, tree holes, rain barrels, flower pots, roof gutters, ornamental foundations, and when used as directed, ER3 will not adversely affect humans, animals, fish, or vegetation. Adult mosquitoes can fly freely to any non-protected place. Barrier treatments will provide longer lasting controls to areas where mosquitoes like to hide and rest. A more effective and a longer lasting method of mosquito reduction is through the use of barrier controls. Barrier controls readily lend themselves to large areas or to small backyards. Years ago, it was discovered that by applying a perimeter strip of barrier protection, mosquitoes, while they're capable of flying over the barrier strip, resisted that treated area within the barrier. Space treatments will place the product in the air, which floats with the breeze to contact and knock down adult mosquitoes. So this fogging type treatment is an excellent way to clear a large area of adult mosquitoes because the product floats into almost every nook and cranny. Reporting procedures are especially important to the success of mosquito reduction programs. Proper use of the mosquito reduction inspection report on each visit is vital in establishing good customer relations and enlisting the customer support in your mosquito reduction program. Be sure you identify all applicable breeding sites and check off the appropriate control strategies and control methods for each. Your training will emphasize the importance of understanding mosquito biology and habits as related to your reduction strategies and your control methods. Customer education is just as critical. You must set the proper expectations that they will have for your mosquito reduction program. Your knowledge and thorough inspection process, coupled with dynamic communication to your customer, will make you the most important part of this program. Together, you and your customer can reduce their exposure to mosquito bites and help prevent the spread of mosquito-borne illnesses. You are indeed a protector of public health. So there you have it. Our unique new formulation, EcoRader ER3, has been very helpful in our mosquito reduction efforts. With this new generation formulation, we've been able to achieve triple action mosquito reduction with one single product. This product has been very useful as an adult aside, as well as giving us the opportunity to use the same product as our larvicide application. All this while giving us some spatial repellency, which will keep mosquitoes from an unwanted area. I think you'll find if you try this product that it will save you a lot of effort, a lot of time, uh, less need for other products to be used in your arsenal, and you'll get favorable results from this unique new green formulation, Eco Raider ER3. All right, so hope you enjoyed that. Uh, a couple questions always come up. I'll go ahead and address a couple things right now. Uh, one of the primary considerations when you're doing mosquito treatments out there is that you do follow all the safety precautions for the products that you're using. Uh, you noticed in that video, I was not wearing any specific respirators. I did not have long sleeves. I didn't have a, a mask on. Uh, 
didn't have gloves on, and none of those things are required with the ER3. So I found it to be very, very uh, beneficial to me in my outings, uh, especially on those hot days, not to be cumbered with all those safety requirements. However, if you're in a state that just very specifically says you must do these things regardless of what the label says, then you follow those state recommendations. But uh, when you choose a product, whether it's ER3 or whether you have something else that you're using uh, that's working well for you, that's your choice. Uh, you want something that's going to kill the adult mosquito on contact. Uh, you're going to have to use something in standing water to take care of the larvae. Uh, you probably want to use something that will last as far as your spatial repellency for a period of time. Uh, larvicide action of this product allows you to use fewer products in your arsenal uh, and probably save a little money there as well, uh, which would also save you some time running back and forth to your vehicle to get other things and, and go apply them. Uh, there's no known resistance issues with uh, with this particular product. Again, it's that octopamine enzyme that uh, that it's addressing, and uh, just about all the other products out there are doing something to control the nervous system of the insect, and that's not where this is directed. So. Uh, it might be something to work into uh, into your situation to help prevent resistance issues from coming up with other types of pesticides that you're habitually using. Uh, remember, you have to, to change the family of pesticides, not just the name or the common name of the pesticide uh, to help avoid resistance issues. Uh, it does have a pleasant smell to it, and uh, one of the strong things about it is there's really no need for an adjuvant. Uh, if you're used to adding something that makes it stick to things better. With this product, you really don't need that. It, uh, it has sodium lauryl sulfate, which works very, very well as an adjuvant in there. Matter of fact, one of our technicians told us when he was doing the field trials that he noticed it was sticking better to the leaves as he was using it than the product that he was used to using. So it's something for you to consider. Uh, we, we would like you to give it a shot if you would. That's the... the paid political part of this program, uh, but you know, you can use all the uh, control tactics and techniques to uh, uh, work with whatever products you're using out there and it should work well for you. So with that, uh, Ed, I think we're at the end of this program. Uh, and, yeah, we got uh, time for a few questions and I answered a few <laughs> during the webinar and I left some several purposefully just so that you'd have some to answer um i know we're we're right at the end so i'll just read them off and dennis you can answer what is the possibility of insect resistance to er3 should we rotate with pyrethroids uh right now we have not seen any resistance uh, problems at all and again the whole idea being we mentioned the octopamine uh and it has not shown any resistance we take that further, the, you know, a product like this, we also have formulated with the same active uh, ingredients in our bed bug. And uh, we know that there's been bed bug resistance out there and we've yet to see any bed bug resistance using these products. And again, it's because we're using something in a different family of chemicals, not just rotating between this pyrethroid brand name to that pyrethroid brand name. So I always suggest that you use some rotation with whatever you're using out there. Uh, but certainly uh, right now we've not noticed anything at all in the way of resistance with this product. Okay, I know you've answered uh, kind of this one indirectly, but um, I just left it on here anyway. Is ER3 a restricted use chemical? Absolutely not. I think you saw uh, with the not, not even using any safety requirements uh, in applying it. It's, uh, it can be freely used out there uh, in, a, in a multitude of ways. It's certainly not restricted in any regard. Definitely. Um, here we have one. Estimated residual, the biggest difference between natural and synthetically derived products, pyrethroids generally, is residual efficacy. What can we expect with Eco Raider? 
uh, with Eco Raider, uh, you're probably going to get out to uh, somewhere between 14 and 21 days. Uh, depends on the area you're treating and what the weather has been. Certainly, if you get uh, major rainstorms, it doesn't matter what you use, you're probably going to get retreats. But uh, you should get a, at least about a three week residual out of this. So, uh, some companies are. are uh, going back on three week cycles now, if they're using green products. Uh, if you couple this with the larvicide action and everything else, you're probably going to be able to, to stretch it to a month uh, because of the combination effect of both of them. Okay. Uh, can you use it on a koi pond? Uh, you can use it on a koi pond. There's no known uh, adverse effects with this product against anything that has a vertebrate. The only precaution I would give you is, uh, you know, most of those koi ponds that I've been familiar with, the koi themselves have their own pet names. Uh, they're pretty expensive fish, and that's usually what I tell somebody is you might want to uh, consider on your own. Uh, if something happens to a koi in that pond, uh, they're going to blame it on you regardless. So it's something that you would have to make a, your own educated decision on. I don't think it would be a factor, uh, but then the burden of proof would lie on you if something were to happen otherwise. So uh, use uh, a little bit of uh, uh, your own uh, cognizance there when you uh, decide you want to treat around something like that. I have had people that have treated koi ponds and reported back to me that they had no problems. Okay. Uh, again, you, you pretty much went through this, but I'm just reading it off because I left it here. Is no PPE required or recommended? Uh, there is no recommended PPE requirements per the label. But again, you may want to check with your state agency. Sometimes they require... Uh, certain types of PPE regardless of the label uh, based on state laws that they have in place. So if you know your state laws, you should be fine. Uh, with EcoRater, there really is no requirement for any, uh, uh, well, you saw me in the video, uh, you know, you could absolutely be out there uh, doing it just the way that, that it was used in the video. Okay. How would you express to a client that this 25B product is just as good as a synthetic? Most customers are looking for the most powerful product. Well, that's where you've got to uh, decide on uh, how you want to deal with that customer. Uh, quite frankly, you probably could go uh, into some of these cases and, and control the mosquitoes just by controlling the water and never ever putting a barrier out there. But uh, that's another day and another time. Our job is to go out there and make money for our, our companies as well as protect the consumers. So uh, it, it's something you're just going to have to educate yourself on. Uh, you know, get it, give it a test run, try it out for yourself, see how it works, uh, and then base your reactions to it uh, compared to what you're using already. Uh, and in some cases, like we said, you may want to uh, maybe increase the frequency of your service uh, to cover it. But the critical factor involved in all of this is uh, you. It's where you're placing it. It's uh, doing the right things. It's controlling the stagnant water sources. And you're going to have to do that with any product that you choose to use. So. Um, you're just going to have to weigh the two uh, for yourself and, and approach it that way. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, hi. How the product can kill, how can the product kill if it repels too? Maybe I did not understand that well. That's, that's the question. Well, again, you're going to, you're going to kill with it because of uh, putting it on those barriers when it dries. Uh, if it, hits a flying insect, if it hits a resting insect, it's going to kill it on contact. Uh, if you put it out in the air, it's going to repel for a certain length of time. Uh, but as we said, that's going to be short lived. So you're going to get a little bit of spatial repellency to keep them out of an area. Uh, but the bigger 
part of it then is your barrier applications, your barriers with residual is going to be there then to kill once that spatial repellency wears off. Uh, and again, I did note in the video that many years ago, I helped uh, a fellow from uh, another manufacturer. Uh, we did some mosquito uh, testing uh, when we first got into doing mosquito work. In fact, it was so long ago, I was uh, still with Orkin, and that's probably been 20 some years ago. Uh, but we did note that when we uh, were treating and putting barriers around a yard, that the mosquitoes, even though they could have freely flown over into the non treated areas of the yard, uh, they really avoided that area. They did not want to fly across those barriers. Okay. Uh, let's see here. What service cycle or timeline is recommended for mosquito services? That's where you're going to have to uh, come up with your own program. Uh, I have a company that I'm working right now and I'm doing it on a monthly basis. There are some companies out there that prescribe to a three week cycle. Uh, there are some companies out there that are going every other month. So you're going to have to find out what works for you. Uh, scheduling is involved. Uh, it depends on how you're servicing, where you're servicing, what you're servicing, uh, the type of mosquito that's present in your area, uh, just a lot of different factors you need to consider. So uh, develop your program accordingly. Can ER3 be applied on edible plant or fruit trees? Uh, sure, you could do that. It, uh, it doesn't have any drawbacks to it. Uh, we would just suggest that uh, you probably want to make sure when they uh, use those edibles that they wash them, and they're probably going to do that anyway. So uh, it, it should not be a, a problem at all. Uh, let's see. Is the larvicide applied with sprayer or mist blower or in some other method? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Uh, you can mix it. You, you could actually pour it in the water if you want to do it that way. Uh, I just simply go ahead and use the mist blower. I've already got it mixed in there and I blow it right into the water. Uh, so I'm doing it as part of my treatment as I go around, spend a few extra seconds over that little uh, water pond in the backyard and getting it down in there uh, so that you're getting the treatment in there. But you can put it in a sprayer and spray it in there. Uh, you know, the key is that you put it in the water and get it uh, mixed into the water okay. These are great questions, by the way. Uh, which of the ingredients provide each of the three actions, contact kill, larvae control, spatial repellency? Well, it all works uh, in conjunction. I mean, it, it has uh, four different active ingredients that all blend together uh, to give it the good action there. So it's, uh, it, it's a mixture of all those that uh, that really make the whole thing work. So you're using the same specific formulation for all three. Yeah, definitely. Uh, efficacy against ticks in a barrier program, question mark. Can't answer that. I don't have any research to base it on. Uh, I can tell you that I suspect it would work okay, but I do not have any test that I could uh, honestly quote you on to say that I proved it worked. Uh, how many gallons need to be sprayed on an average size lot? Uh, you know, average size lot depends on how many plants, how many shrubs, how many breeding sites, how many little buildings, how many resting sites you're finding on your survey. So uh, that's going to vary based on just what's on that lot. So, uh, and, and with anything you use, that same thing comes into play. So uh, my house, uh, the, the house you saw in the video, probably would take about four gallons total to do it properly. Okay. Uh, we experience 100 degree Fahrenheit in Belize. How long will this product last under harsh temperatures? Well, I don't think that the harsh temperatures are going to be a, a big impact to it. I, I can't really answer anything at that. Uh, where we tested with the field trials, it was probably in the 70s and low 80s and uh, certainly didn't have any major impact there. 
But, uh, you know, if you're in Belize and you've got extreme temperature folds, uh, it's probably going to last just as long as anything else that you could put out there. So, again, you're probably going to know the answer to that better than I would. Uh, how long is, does the repellency last aerial? Aerial repellency, basically. Aerial spatial repellency, if you're doing like a, a picnic area or something like that, again, it's it's going to knock them down. Uh, you're probably going to get a lot of action for several hours. Uh, but then you can go days after that because of the other things that it's done for you. It's, it's put those barriers in place around as well, and it's caused them to... Uh, flee the area if they weren't killed by it on contact so like i said my son had a wedding on the back porch of a guy's deck uh, and the guy couldn't even use his deck the mosquitoes were so bad back this day i went out to look at it with him they were eating this alive and uh, it was probably uh weeks before he saw another mosquito after we had done it so it's a combination of those factors, not so much just the keeping them out of the air, but they do not want to cross those barriers then. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions. Danny, uh, why am I not seeing any questions after the fruit tree one? Uh, how do we claim CEUs? I'm not sure about the questions. A lot of them I haven't answered in the chat box. I've answered them by talking to Dennis. So. You might not see an answer in the little Q&A section. I've just been reading them to Dennis and clicking answer live on our end. So if you don't see an answer, that's why. Uh, but we've answered everything so far. Uh, also, your CEUs, like we said this at the beginning, I just want to um, repeat it. There's an email that's going to go out to everyone. Georgia and Tennessee, uh, there's a form. You're going to fill it out. Uh, there's an email in in the e-blast that we're sending out. You're going to email that form back to us, and then we will submit it for New Mexico and uh, Colorado. Uh, we will we will submit the attendance, and that will count as your um, as your assurance of getting credits. Okay. Um, okay. So a few more questions. Um, let's see here. Uh, follow up on tick barrier question. Some customers request both pests to be treated. Could application of pesticides with or on top of ER3 destroy its efficacy? Uh, you know, probably not. I, I think you're going to have a, something where you've got two products actually sprayed out there. If one's labeled for tick control, then you're okay with that. Uh, I would do that first and then put the eco rater on top of it. Okay. Um, let's see here. Here's one. Honeybees, question mark. Uh, would it kill honeybees? Yes. Okay. So you want to uh, make sure that in that cycle where you, if somebody's raiding honeybees, you stay away from them. Uh, you also want to make sure that uh, when they are trying to pollinate, in other words, when the flowers are blooming and they are uh, coming to the flowers to uh, pick up the pollen, you don't want to be treating there with anything during that time phase. Um, and most states are uh, looking at that very closely now. So uh, I know in, in my state here in Georgia, uh, mid to north Georgia, that usually is uh, sometime in uh, late May, early June, and it really only lasts for a couple of weeks uh, during the pollination phase. So you just got to be careful when you see them uh, buzzing the plants to pollinate, and uh, you just don't want to treat. Even if you're using some other product, uh, uh, same effect. You, you don't want to be treating any flowered plants while they're pollinating. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Does the label provide different mixing ratios for being used as a larvicide versus being used as an adulticide or when treating larger pools of water like retention ponds or bird baths? Uh, bird baths, it's fine just to use it at the, the same rate as your, your adulticiding. Smaller actions, backyard pest control actions, uh, you can use it straight out of your mist blower, uh, the same mixture that you're using for an adulticide. Uh, 
Uh, we have never intended that you take this product and put it into a large retention pond. Uh, that's where you probably are going to have to do something different. Okay. How long is the expiration date of the product if stored properly? Uh, it should last for quite a while, uh, several years, actually. Uh, I've actually had uh, product people told me, hey, I kept it in the winter and it froze. Uh, just let it thaw and shake it up real good. Uh, it's natural ingredients in there. And as long as you shake it really good, uh, you know, after those cases and keep it blended, uh, it's going to last for quite a while. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what do you see that people are saying about, I mean, in the industry and um, about the mosquito possibly becoming a vector for COVID? Is, is there any correlation there? Uh, right now, as far as anything I've read, there is no known uh, uh, situation for that. Uh, and I wouldn't want to go out there trying to scare people into thinking that it is. Okay. Um, and our last question I have on here, uh, will this presentation be archived somewhere for review later on? Yeah, I, I'm sure we'll put a, a copy of it on our website. Uh, it, Eco Raider PMP, um, there's a webinar section called backslash CEU webinar. And, um, and that's it. So uh, and I've got one more on here. COVID is coronal, just like the common cold. No one catches it. It's unethical to suggest. Okay. First of all, I wasn't suggesting anything. I was reading someone's question. So um, I'm just going through the questions and Dennis is answering them. So I hope you didn't. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> um, other than that, um, first of all, the, we've got a lot of people still on here and I really appreciate that. Uh, I really appreciate you guys. Um, um, sticking on with some tremendous questions. Um, this was definitely a, a great start to our webinar series. Uh, again, just, just want to remind you that we have two more. Three weeks from now, we do perimeter pest control. Three weeks after that, we'll do resistance. So that's all on our website. Nothing you need to remember. The place you registered for this one, there's a registration link for each of those. Um, let's see. Also, you will get an email for your CEU, and that's how you'll get your registration, um, your credits uh, with your states. Um, Dennis, anything else to add? Yeah, just ask everybody in Georgia and Tennessee, please send those things back in right away. Don't sit on them for any length of time. Uh, I'd like to get them all back within at least a week if you could possibly do that. Oh, wait, here's one more question. Is there any advantage to mixing, say, with a pyrethroid? None whatsoever. Okay. Okay. Well, hey, thank you again uh, to everybody for uh, taking the time to join us. And uh, uh, thanks again. A shout out. Thank you definitely to Dennis and, and a shout out to uh, Eco Raider for uh, sponsoring this program. Uh, Again, in, in the email that you get, you're going to have an opportunity to try their product with their test run program. So definitely take advantage of it. It's a great product. Um, you, you've heard Dennis talking about some of the reasons why. So definitely take advantage of that when, when you receive the email. Other than that, that's all we have today. And we hope, uh, we hope you guys join us in the future for some of our future webinars. Thank you again.